keeping awake. Hard thing to do on a Sunday morning (laughs) when the minister's preaching. However, there is a story about a Frenchman, an American and a Japanese who face a firing squad. Each one gets one last request. The Frenchman asks to hear the Marseillaise. The Japanese asks to give a lecture on the art of production schedules. And the American says, shoot me first, I can't stand one more lecture on Japanese production schedules. (laughs) Over the years I've conducted a number of weddings for Japanese couples. The last Japanese wedding I conducted The whole day was choreographed down to the last minute. From 8.30 in the morning, hair, fingernails, makeup, through to the limo pickup and arrival at the church. There was a schedule, a timetable. We all schedule or perhaps organise our day in some way. If we're a commuter, we think of a train timetable or a tram timetable. We book our car in for a service. We organise the time to drop it off and the time to pick it up. We invite people over for dinner and usually a list is made of all the things that need to be bought for that dinner or organised. As a chaplain working in schools for 35 years, Parent-teacher interviews were organised around a 10-minute period of time and then the bell would ring and the parents moved on to another teacher. The Latin root of the word schedule means a small piece of paper and a later French root of the word means scroll, note or bill. The inference being that a schedule is something that you put down on paper. And the dictionary, of course, defines it as a list of the time certain things are meant to happen. Scheduling developed early in the activities of human planning and thinking. Imagine for a moment the planning, the scheduling that went into building the pyramids in Egypt, for example. Or even in the mythological story of Noah and the ark, the building of the ark, where God gave Noah all the list of specifications and the schedule to which the ark should be be built. There's a funny joke about the building of the ark, of course. At the end of his sermon, Sunday sermon, the minister announced that he would preach on Noah and the ark the following Sunday and gave the Bible reading to the congregation to be able to read it during the week. And then two little boys decided they would play a joke on the minister. And they snuck up into the pulpit and after looking at the reading from Genesis, they glued two pages together in the pulpit Bible. The next Sunday the minister got up to read the text Noah took unto himself a wife, he began, and she was, and as he turned over the page, 300 cubits long, 50 wide, and 30 high. (laughs) Even Jesus, of course, recognised the importance of scheduling. In one of his stories, he said, if one of you is planning to build a tower, he sits down first and figures out what it will cost to see if he has enough money to finish the job. In this scripture from Mark uh, 13, Jesus is having a private conversation with a couple of his disciples, Peter, James, John and Andrew. Mark has constructed two lengthy discourses in his gospel, one in Mark 4 which focuses on parables towards the end, and Mark 13 on the events that will bring history to a close. In doing so, Mark has, of course, made use of many materials that have come down to him in the oral tradition or which he knew from common Christian or Judean narratives at the time. 
In Mark 13, we see where Jesus' long answer does not actually answer the question posed by the disciples in verse 4 when they ask, when will these things take place? They wanted a schedule, a timetable. There are certain passages in the Gospels that make it clear that Jesus is anticipating an imminent moment of apocalypse. The word apocalypse comes from the Greek word apocalypsis, meaning revealing or uncovering, and tells of events that are to take place at the end of history. Admonitions to be on guard or alert are common in early Christian literature and often in an apocalyptic context. We can deduce from the time when Mark penned his gospel that the Jewish revolt from 66 AD to 70 AD and then with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem that the early church would have looked for what was called the second coming of Christ. And then, of course, decades pass and the first early Christians die out and nothing happened. And then they had to reassess the major way in which these sayings, apocalyptic sayings of Jesus, were to be interpreted. Some conspiracy theories, of course, believed that the end of the world would commence 70 years after the return of the Jews to Israel. Since the United Nations mandate saw the re-establishment of Israel in 1947, that made 2017 an interesting year. But nothing happened. The European outbreak of the Black Death in 1346 was widely believed to be a sign of the impending apocalypse, the end of the earth. And Halley's Comet makes an appearance in our skies roughly every 76 years. But in 1910, some believed the comet would actually cause the end of the world. And the most bizarre prediction for the end of the world was in 1806 when a hen started laying eggs with the words inscribed, Christ is coming. This is fair income. (laughs) Religious fervour gripped Leeds in England and then a couple of sceptical men visited the hen while she was laying her eggs. And after some examination, they realised someone had been inscribing the eggs with corrosive ink and then forcing the eggs back into the hen. When this ruse was exposed, apocalyptic mania died down and the hen went back to her normal routine, I guess. And those of you here, and I guess most of you here, who can remember the 13 days of the Cuban Missile Crisis of October 1962, when a confrontation took place between the United States and the Soviet Union, initiated by the United States' discovery of Soviet ballistic missiles deployed in Cuba. It is often regarded as the closest moment in the Cold War to becoming a hot war. It brought the world very close to a possible Third World War and a nuclear war at the same time. We almost had our apocalyptic ending. And consider today the list of nine countries who possess nuclear weapons. Staying awake or keeping alert is a normal condition for such watchfulness. During the height of the Cold War, America had B-52 bombers flying 24-7 around Greenland and the North Pole for years, ready to launch missiles at Russia. And in England, the British Royal Air Force had their Vulcan bombers on a two-minute alert for the same thing. Keeping awake, keeping alert was the name of the game. And the word apocalypse, of course, is not unknown in the movie world. If you remember the movie set in the Vietnam War and released in August 1979, Apocalypse Now. It was loosely based on Joseph Conrad's novel of 
1902, The Heart of Darkness. There are many instances of people trying to wake people up about things. Kashuhiko Ishibashi is a well-respected professor and seismologist at Kobe University in Japan. Since the early 2000s, he has been warning Japan that the country's many nuclear power plants are in danger of serious damage or even meltdown because they've been built in earthquake-prone areas. All of Ishibashi's fears came true on March the 11th, 2011, when a huge offshore earthquake and resulting tsunami damaged the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, resulting in a level seven international nuclear event scale disaster, the highest level nuclear disaster possible. In May 2011, he said, if Japan had faced up to the dangers earlier, we could have prevented Fukushima. So Mark, in his gospel, puts into the mouth of Jesus a message for the church. Stay awake. Stay conscious. Amidst the challenges and the portents of the age, don't go to sleep. For us Christians living in the modern world, there's a great temptation to go to sleep. Like falling asleep at the wheel when you're fatigued by the pace of modern life. Whether it's being deprived of physical sleep or a spiritual sleep, the challenge is to stay conscious. And we live in the sedation of the plastic world, which is the product of our free market economies. We are told not to worry about things because the governments of our day of any persuasion will take care of us. We're overwhelmed with messages of consumer utopia and the anticipation of a better tomorrow from the next generation of technologies, a paradise of iPods and plasma TVs and egg-shaped electric cars where we will all live in skyscrapers made of glass. And for many people who find life boring or meaningless, the addictions of our age will make sure that we will continue to live in a world of sedation. In Tuesday's Age, Shane Wright, the economics writer, wrote an article called Sleepwalking Towards the Next Financial Crisis. He was suggesting that governments stay alert, keep awake about the economic circumstances we are in today. And so what are the signs of the times that should keep the church awake? If we think on a global perspective, three billion people live on less than $2.50 a day. The poorest 40% of the world's population accounts for 5% of global income. The richest 20% accounts for three quarters of world income. Today, this Sunday, around 21,000 children under the age of five will die from poverty, hunger, preventable diseases and illness. And again, on a global perspective, the Borgen Project lists the top 10 important global issues, not in any order of priority, but climate change, pollution, violence, security and well-being, lack of education, unemployment, government corruption, malnourishment and hunger, substance abuse and terrorism. So it's very easy for us to be discouraged by such huge issues. But by being alert, staying awake, we can make a difference. And our world is a very different place to what it used to be even 10 years ago. And what of our place here, St Michael's, the local city church? What do we need to do to stay awake, to keep ourselves alert about, to be watchful of the times and culture 
we find ourselves in. St Michael's has always been a preaching church throughout its history. It has had and enjoyed many great orators. It has a providence of being the thinking person's church and I'm sure that will continue to be in the future. But today we are in a context of choice. Just down the road in Collins Street is Hillsong, which meets in the Athenaeum Theatre and has two or three services on a Sunday. Down the road, St Paul's Cathedral sees itself as having a significant ministry to the city. It is appointed a canon who is Chinese and they print their services in English and in Chinese. And the Archbishop sponsors conversations with various people on important social issues at the edge. He has a presence in the city. In Swanson Street Church, uh, Swanson Street rather, is a church of Christ called Cross Cultural which has 700 mainly Asian students in its morning service. And if we're thinking about a thinking person's church, how do we make that part of our niche market here at St Michael's? With RMIT just up the road and Melbourne University within easy access. And I'm sure that there are people in the CBD and surrounding suburbs who would respond to the progressive Christian stance of St Michael's and the style, the content and the music that St Michael's has to offer. So, let's stay awake and be aware of our opportunities.